Jack. Yes, Lord. Hey, do you remember me from yesterday? Uh, at the museum? Yes. And the, you were going to... The paint, uh, the pit. Where were you going to? We, we're the going to Ibiza, yes, tomorrow. Did, oh, I thought it was today. No, it's tomorrow. Oh, wow. Well. And this is your son? Sorry? Your, your <laughs> we're friend. friends, yeah, yeah. Your friend. Are you also from the same place as... Uh, no, I'm from Oh, you hard luck. Yeah, I know. Oh, hard luck. I do feel <laughs> sorry for you. Charles Dickens wrote a story about Preston, which is worth reading mm -hmm. because of the content of it. Yeah. Not so much for the style. Dickens' style is rather... Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, have you ever read any of Dickens' things? No. No, no, no well, I haven't, no. I haven't read much Goethe, so we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're in a similar... Well, um, Dickens is a, is a social uh, engineer. Mm -hmm. his, his interest is in improving the living conditions of Victorian England, which were appalling. Uh, Disraeli, the Prime Minister, said England is a country of two nations, mm -hmm. the rich and the poor. And in London, I things I've got, were I've got so to move, I've got to bad that there were 2,000 prostitutes under the age of eight, female prostitutes. Not because they wanted to be prostitutes, but because they were starving to death. There were no schools until 1871, not one school, not one school. But the rich and the powerful had universities. Oxford University goes back a long way, Cambridge University also. And there were schools for them as well. Everything that a child needed was provided for the rich and the powerful, but for the ordinary people there, was, there just wasn't anything. In yeah. fact, there wasn't childhood. There was no such thing as childhood for ordinary people. And uh, Dickens' story about Preston, why did he write about Preston? Well, he went all over England by train looking for the worst possible environmental conditions. And when he got off the train here, he put his name in the uh, book in the railway pub, which is near the railway station. Mm -hmm. and it says Charlie Dickens. And he said, I found, I found it, I found the worst place in England for environmental conditions. And the reason he picked on Preston, or, uh, the book is called Hard Times, and the, the, the Preston, he doesn't use the word Preston because Preston was a powerful, industri uh, powerful industrial base and they could have stopped publication of his book. So it's a novel and he calls it Coke Town. And he calls it Coke Town because, have you noticed the parish church, the big church in the middle of the town? Yes. Yeah. Well, that's called the parish church, and behind that, a few hundred meters, there used to be a coke works. Uh, there's a uh, there's a multi-story car park. There was a coke works, and the fumes from that were so bad that people were dying from respiratory illness at a greater rate than anywhere else in England. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, how long ago was this? Sorry. How long ago was this? This would be in the late, the mid to late 1800s. Okay. We call it the Victorian period. Mm -hmm. Victoria came to the throne in 1832, mm -hmm. and she died in 1901, mm -hmm. approximately. Um, so it was in the mid-Victorian period. Really. Not so long ago, when you think about it, mm -hmm. um, when my parents, I come from before the Second World War, uh, and my parents, my dad came from the Victorian period. You know, so he knew about things like that on a personal basis. You know, he. He always used to say to me, Jack, we, when I was born, we didn't have any electricity in the house or any water. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, when we did get electricity in the late 1930s, mm -hmm. um, and when we, did we get water? No, we didn't get water. We just got electricity. Okay. Um, my dad used to say to me, Jack, put the lights off. He's absolutely terrified <laughs> of paying the electric bills, you see, because he never had such a thing. We had oil lamps, and we never had a cooker, we had a fire with a range. And it was a, a fire contained in a, a metal box, as it were, mm -hmm. with slats. And on either side of it were two ovens, one, one on the left and one on the right. Mm -hmm. And the heat from the fire provided the heat for cooking. It was called a range, you can still see them in museums. And uh, we had, my dad grew food, his own food, and uh, uh, we did wonderfully, because we, 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 we didn't live in town all the time. See, my dad was very bright, and he said to me, Jack, we live in town half the year, and half the town here in the countryside, you see. <laughs> so we'd rent a place in town, and then rent one in the country, and that was my best times in my life in the countryside.
yeah, it's like they weren't climbing trees. I didn't yeah, mind being in town. I like. Th I think towns are busy. I love San Francisco, and Paris, yeah. Vienna, Rome. You know, I love many of the big cities of the world. I love Mumbai very much. Bombay, as we call it, and Madras, and Chennai, as they call it. I love a lot of many big cities, but my heart, if I have to say it, is more in the country. So, mm. more, but yeah. I'm people orientated, you see. I'm a bit like Dickens. My main interest is in human beings, and you don't get many human beings in the countryside. That's true, yeah. And also, they are a bit xenophobic in the countryside. That's the downside of it. The good side of it is, in a good country village, everybody knows everybody else. Mm -hmm. But the downside is, if you go into that society, you are sometimes seen as an outsider mm -hmm. or a foreigner. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in Wales, in North Wales, in South Wales, it's a mining community, very friendly, instantly welcome into the society. But in North Wales, it's more English, mm -hmm. and you might go into North Wales and go into a pub, and they wouldn't talk your language. They yeah. speak in Welsh deliberately to avoid speaking to you. And you might spend 15 years in a village in North Wales before they spoke to you. Yeah. They're a bit xenophobic. Now, it's not like that in England, but nevertheless, there is a there is a slight bit of xenophobia between the country people. In There are some country uh, districts which, for better or worse, they are a bit xenophobic. Mm -hmm. Parochial is the word, yeah. rather than xenophobic. <laughs> Of <laughs> uh, and I'm sure you must get, you see, we destroyed Hamburg, we destroyed it in a firestorm. You won't know about this, it was all before your time, but we destroyed Hamburg, and that led to Hamburg becoming a modern city. And uh, Kevin Keegan went there, the Beatles went there. You heard of the Beatles? Yeah. yeah. Kevin Keegan? Yeah. Uh, good, yeah. Uh, Bundesliga Player of the Year. Sorry? He was Bundesliga Player of the Year, mm -hmm. twice. And European Player of the Year. He played for Liverpool originally, and then he was transferred to Hamburg. And uh, he used to say, when he first went there, they would have passed the ball to him. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> and he was a man who needed the ball. You know, he was he was ultra fast, very brave. But he needed the ball. When he ran into position, if they didn't give him the ball, he couldn't score. But for the first two weeks, they would have passed it to him. England, you know. And so, uh, but he won them over. He won them over by his work rate and by his friendliness. Because mm. I think, initially, if you go anywhere in the world, you've got to be prepared to be a little bit like they are. Yeah. You know the old saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> there used to be a thing called the goose step. Have you ever heard of it? No. Well, the Nazis. You've heard of the Nazis? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they had this. I'll show you. They had a goose step. Can you just hold this a minute? Yeah. I'll show you. Hitler, he was, you know, it's an Austrian, he wasn't German. None of his ideas were Germanic, in my view. He made his man be the goose step, it was like this. I <laughs> <laughs> see, and these stormtroopers used to walk about like that. Nobody laughed at them, you know. If they had a laughed at them, they might have, might have helped things a bit. And a friend of mine who was in the, what we call the boat service, they call it the SAS now. Mm -hmm. It was the boat service. His job during the war was to kill people. I mean, they were all out to kill people anyway. The English were out to kill the Germans, and the, uh, the Germans were out to kill the English, and all the rest of it. You okay, sir? Good morning, sir. Drink some water. Oh, thank you very much. That's really nice of you. Yeah, thank I'll, you very much. Have the full thing. Oh, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, thank you very much. 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 He had lots of ways to clean them with cheese wire and all sorts of things. He was a specialist, you see. Very gentle man. Yeah. I mean, you know, he, he flew the Spitfire. I don't know, have you heard of that, the Spitfire? No. Well, have you heard of the Focke Wolf? The Messerschmitt? Well, anyway, these were the German aeroplanes, the Focke Wolf and okay. the Messerschmitt. The English had a, an aeroplane called the Spitfire, which they, they thought it was wonderful. You know, it wasn't any better than the Messerschmitt, really, but it was just a little bit faster. Maybe 10 miles faster. It just gave them. Just yeah. it appears to be 25 mm -hmm. um, <laughs> But they probably got Churchill on it or somebody. Um, it was a it was a strange time. But I once said to him, "Why did you ever go at that little Austrian bloke? It was cause a gold the trouble." Hitler, you see. He said, uh, "He said he was our best ally." He said he was our best ally. He said our best ally. He said yes, because there were 12 attempts by German people on Hitler's life. There were 12. They don't publicise them very much. They, 
they publicised one main one when he was nearly blown up in, uh, by a bomb, but it, the, the man in the office, in the room where it was, he, it was in a briefcase and he pushed the briefcase away, he didn't know, and that mm -hmm. saved Hitler's life. But my friend could have killed Hitler, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he could have, and he was very good at his job. And I said, why didn't you have a go at it? He said, well, he was our best ally. I said, what do you mean our best ally? Well, there was a fellow called, uh, uh, what was his name, head of the German Luftwaffe, Goering. Goering, who was the deputy prime minister, or deputy, whatever Hitler called him, and at Dunkirk, where the English were trapped, initially they sent over a lot of soldiers and the German army were much better prepared, they were better than us, that's the truth of it, and they could have destroyed us at Dunkirk, because the English were, uh, they were bottled in, they were surrounded, and they could have been destroyed, the expeditionary force, 100,000 men or something like that, the bulk of the British army at that time. And uh, Hitler, Hitler said, we mustn't kill them, they are our friends, they are part German, you know, as you know, we're, we're part of the Germanic English people. And uh, so, Goering said, no, we must destroy the lot. And if Hitler had listened to Goering, the British would have been destroyed. And now we would have, uh, we would have, uh, we would have, uh, well, it wouldn't be Heidelberg, Preston's not beautiful enough to be Heidelberg, but it would be somewhere like, uh, no, it's not big enough to be Munich, but it would be it would be a German part of Germany today, yeah. um, which wouldn't be a bad thing really. Because yeah. I'll be honest with you, I've a, I've far more regard for Angela, Angela Merkel than I have for Theresa uh, May. I think she's an absolute Tartar, mm -hmm. very much against the English. Whereas Angela Merkel is a very human person and very democratic and very caring. Mm -hmm. The way I see her, because I don't really know what she's like. I'm very fond of Angela Merkel and the German culture. And you see, for, strangely enough, uh, you can criticise anybody. You know, I always think if you look for bad in someone, you will find it. If you look for good, you will find it. Maybe in the, the worst of people in the world, there is some good, and in the best of persons, there is some bad. You see, so you often find what you look for.